Um, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Pauline Murphy. Um, could I ask you, uh, before we begin, to turn off your mobile phones, as I would do myself? Um, we are very fortunate to have with us today um, Ivo Dalver, who is chair of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Uh, I was asking him before the beginning, uh, was this another body beside the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations? And he told me, no, this is the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations uh, for the past how many years? Last 13 years has been changed, yeah. But, but 80 years we were the Chicago Council on, uh, uh, on Foreign Affairs. Foreign Relations. Foreign Relations, yeah. Foreign, yeah. yeah. Um, he um, has an upcoming book called The Empty Throne, which uh, indeed is part of the title of his uh, talk to us, um, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. Um, you couldn't have come at a better time, uh, Ambassador Dalver, uh, to talk to us about this. Uh, we um, in this institution, and indeed public opinion more generally, I think, um, are very concerned about uh, precisely uh, America's abdication of global leadership. Uh, the implications of this for uh, the international order generally um, at a time when uh, not only in the United States but in other countries uh, forces um, are um, militating against precisely this order. So uh, we regard it as particularly serious uh, that uh, this situation should uh, obtain in the United States. And Ambassador Dowder has been president of the uh, Chicago Council on Global Affairs since 2013. Um, and prior to that, he served as the US ambassador to NATO. And I think we, uh, many of us will have come across his name um, when he had that responsibility. Um, he has previously uh, been a senior fellow in foreign policy studies at the Brookings Institution, um, a, a highly impressive institution which uh, uh, I think bodies like this one, the Institute for International and European Affairs, uh, try to emulate but uh, never quite succeed. So Ambassador Dalder, you're very welcome if you'd like to make your presentation. Terrific, thank you so much and thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to come and speak here before the publication of the book, which is actually scheduled to, to come out in, uh, in the US uh, on Tuesday. And I should say that uh, it is a book I did not write by myself. I wrote it together with my uh, good, uh, long friend, uh, Jim Lindsay, who uh, is the Senior Vice President and Director of Research at the, at, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, we're older uh, by about six months than they are. That's what we like. I'd like to remind them. Uh, we both have our anniversary in, 20, uh, in 2022. Um, uh, but Jim and I have been colleagues at Brookings, uh, in fact. Uh, we wrote a book on the, on the uh, Bush administration in, in the early uh, 2000s. And uh, uh, after the shock of the election of Donald Trump, sometime in March uh, of 2017, uh, I called Jim and said, I think we need to do a book on Donald Trump. Um, so that's what we did. We, the book is actually two things. It's an argument, and I'm going to tell you what that argument is, um, but it is also meant to be a narrative history of the first 18 months of uh, Donald Trump's foreign policy. Uh, and it is written for uh, a public that is per perhaps not as engaged in these issues ever as everybody uh, here is. Uh, um, so it is a, a basic treatise of what has happened. and. Um, Actually, rereading it once in a while and looking back at it, it's pretty astonishing what's happened uh, over the past uh, 18, uh, 18 months. And we may have many more months, uh, if not years, to go. Uh, so the second edition may be even more interesting. <laughs> Already thinking about that. The argument that we're making is fundamentally this, that America's global leadership has been the central defining feature of global politics and indeed of American foreign policy for the better part of 70 years. Um, that leadership was born out of the devastation of World War II, uh, and World War I and World War II. Uh, the fact that the United States was called upon twice 
uh, yeah, within almost a single generation to come to the aid uh, of Europe in order to deal with uh, the reality that Europe could only deal with itself through war rather than peace uh, unless the United States was involved led to the assessment in the 1940s, first by Franklin Roosevelt, then by Harry Truman, uh, and what were then called the wise men, and unfortunately or fortunately they were all men, uh, to decide uh, that the United States could not do what it did in uh, 1918, and that is depart Europe after war. It had to stay. And in fact, it had to stay in the world, uh, that it had the power uh, to do so. It was the largest military power in the world. It was the sole possessor of nuclear weapons uh, in uh, 1945. Its economy was not only intact, uh, but had, had grown tremendously as a result of the war effort, uh, representing more than 50% of global GDP. Uh, it had uh, uh, demonstrated the importance of uh, democracy and human rights and the rule of law in international politics and it now had to uh, make the decision to remain engaged. And from 1944 to 1950, uh, it used the power that it had to build a new global order. Uh, whether you call it the liberal international order or the rules-based order or whatever you want to call it, uh, we call it the rules-based order. Um, it was an order based on, on three fundamental precepts. Uh, one, that you needed to create security structures, alliances, uh, to prevent a return to war and to enable countries in Europe and Asia to focus on rebuilding their economies and their societies in peace. That you needed to create an economic, an international economic uh, regime, a trading regime that encouraged prosperity for all uh, and encouraged interdependence of economic activity rather than an autarky. And that third, one had to be in defend, not only defend, but where possible promote democracy and freedom. Remember the Truman Drop Doctrine in 1947 was a declaration that the United States would defend democracy wherever it was threatened. We saw the Declaration of Human Rights uh, negotiated by the United Nations, uh, pushed by uh, not a president, but a first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the emergence of the rule of law through the UN Charter uh, and other institutions. And so uh, a, a new order was built, um, a order that was at its core dependent on American power, and that without American power and without American leadership, uh, it would not be able to uh, survive. It was built on the precept that the United States should make short-term sacrifices for long-term gain, that you open up your market to others, even if they did not open up their markets to you, because that would build prosperity and therefore a larger consumer base, and therefore the ability for everyone to thrive, that you provided security for others so that they could uh, live in peace rather than have to, uh, you have to come back and, and fight another world war. Uh, that if you promoted democracy among your neighbors, you are more likely to be both free and prosperous. And so the U.S. for 70 years conducted a foreign policy based on, those, on, on the shaping and then main, maintenance of a global international order that turned out to be the most successful foreign policy conducted by any nation ever in the world a foreign policy that brought untold security, untold prosperity, and untold freedom to untold numbers of people, and even ended the, one of the greatest conflicts of the 20th century without firing a shot, that is the Cold War. Um, it was a success that few could have thought was possible when uh, the peace uh, VE uh, occurred in May of tw uh, 1945 in VJ Day in August of uh, of that same year. Uh, in 1990, the United States emerged from a 40-year-long uh, Cold War as the undisputable global single superpower, the hyperpower, as Hubert Fiedrin called it, uh, in the world, and had to think about how do we use the power that we have 
to go forward, no longer to fight a Cold War and maintain a Western uh, rules-based order, but to see what else it could do. And the decision was um, that the United States could actually do for the world what it had done for the West, and to create a more open, more free, uh, more uh, uh, global rules-based order. And it was based on two fundamental assumptions that the Clinton and Bush administration, however different administrations they were, share. One you might call the Fukuyama, although Frank would dispute uh, it, the Fukuyama hypothesis that we were indeed ending uh, history. That liberal democracy was the final state of, of uh, development and that uh, the United States now had the power through its attraction, what Joe Knight called soft power, uh, and through its hard power to enhance liberal democracy throughout uh, the world. Um, America had that power. It could do so by enlarging NATO, which enabled the enlargement of the European Union. And by the way, no country um, has joined uh, the EU without joining NATO unless they were unless, you, unless it's uh, um, two former neutral countries, Finland and, and Sweden. That is, you had to provide the security basis for enlargement before you could provide uh, the economic uh, basis. Uh, you, uh, there was a policy of what, what one might call not only Western enlargement, but Western integration. The, uh, the ability and attractiveness of bringing in other countries into the Western uh, sphere on the basis that somehow liberal democracy was going to win out no matter where it was uh, pushed. We saw in the 90s and into uh, the first part of this century a, uh, a commitment to humanitarian intervention where the United States would lead international coalitions uh, to bring, to try to bring uh, peace and stability in, pla in places that saw neither, first in the Balkans, then in, uh, in Somalia, onwards in Haiti, and of course uh, later on in other parts uh, of the world, including Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, there was the belief that somehow freedom was on the march. Remember the second inaugural of George Bush, where he said that the United States would support democracy in every nation, in every culture, and end tyranny in the world. That was the fundamental post-1990 precept of American foreign policy. Uh, I, I, on one leg, that democracy was on the march and could be uh, promoted wherever it was. The second leg, I belief, was that economic liberalization would inevitably lead to political liberalization. That as you brought countries like Russia and China into the economic order, they would, over time, liberalize. That's how uh, that's why you wanted Russia to become a member of the WTO. It's why you wanted China to become a member of the WTO. If you go back and read Bill Clinton's speech in 1999 where he talks about China having to become a member of the WTO, it is all about the fact that once they economically open up, they will have to change and open up uh, politically. Uh, the European Union was based, based its enlargement proposition on exactly the same principle. That is, you brought countries into the single market, you would transform them uh, politically as well. Those two assumptions, the assumption that you could promote and push liberal democracy uh, and that economic liberalization would lead to political liberalization, those uh, assumptions turn out to be wrong. History has not been kind to either of them. Turns out that uh, democracy <coughs> is not necessarily the only way forward in, uh, as one looks ahead. If you look at what has happened to democracy and the state of democracy in the world, it has been in reverse for the last 11 years. Uh, freedom is not on the march, it is in retreat. Democracy is not on the march, it's in retreat. There are a whole bunch of reasons for this, um, but it, uh, it's not for lack of trying on the part of the Polish people or the Hungarian people or indeed other parts of the world. It's also turned out that force is, doesn't turn out to be a very effective instrument for changing the internal makeup of other society. Uh, that it is much easier to start a war than end them. It is much easier to insert forces into a country than taking them out. The United States, uh, this, what is today, is the 11th. Yesterday, 
um, was the, uh, so, so today, today is the beginning of the 18th year of our war in Afghanistan. Um, the longest war the United States has ever fought in its history. And uh, I've been to Afghanistan many times. I can tell you it is not a thriving democracy. It's many things, but it's not that. Um, and, and so the extraordinary investment, the billions and billions and billions of dollars that not only the United States, but indeed uh, at, at its height, 55 other countries had invested in Afghanistan, sold to their, to their people as a way to bring stability and democracy and, and, and uh, freedom to that country uh, has not panned out. And of course, economic liberalization has not led to political liberalization as we see in China, where in some ways the Chinese leadership under Xi Jinping is more repressive, uh, more, um, uh, uh, more dictatorial uh, than at any time since Mao, uh, where not only a million uh, Uyghurs and Muslims are uh, held in detention camps, but where the astonishing thing, the head of Interpol can be kidnapped uh, and put on trial uh, after have been, having been promoted as the person who was going to lead the international law enforcement community, uh, but, and apparently without any, any consequence. So the idea that somehow political uh, liberalization follows economic liberalization has been disproven by Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, if you want to put it in those terms, uh, and, and it hasn't worked. The Obama presidency was predicated on trying to figure out how to do this better. And how could the United States use the power it had in order to shape uh, the uh, uh, leadership in the world in a, in, a more, in, a, in, a, in a more measured way. With the exception of Libya, which I'm happy to talk about since I was deeply involved in that intervention at the time. Uh, it was an administration that did not believe in intervention and certainly did not believe in intervention in order to bring democracy to other countries. Uh, it did support democracy, but more from below than from above. Uh, so in the Arab Spring, the real idea was it had to come from the people, and if it didn't come from the people, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to work. It uh, didn't work even when it came from the people, as we saw in Egypt. Uh, it focused on uh, cooperation with other powers to deal with the big problems of the day, whether it's climate change uh, or nuclear proliferation or even on terrorism. Uh, it was a more measured foreign policy that still tried to use the power of the United States to deal with big issues, but it was no longer um, uh, infused by the hubris, and I think it was hubris of the Clinton and Bush administrations, uh, on how to use American power in, in its way. And frankly, although I was a part of that administration, and I'm a big supporter of the administration. I don't think Obama's foreign policy worked uh, all that well. Uh, it didn't, uh, it, 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 uh, it raised fundamental questions about what is the American role, how are we going to lead in this new world. So in 2015-16, the question was, how is America going to lead globally? And indeed, Donald Trump put on the uh, on the table whether the United States should lead. And it was in part because we had a crisis about how America should lead that Donald Trump was a a even able to ask the question of whether it should lead. Uh, Trump, you can talk about how he got elected. Uh, it's like talking about how he got Brexit. Um, Trump was elected and came to power on the, with the fundamental belief that the problem for America wasn't that it was leading in the wrong way, it was that it was leading at all. The rules-based order wasn't working, as he would put it, for the United States. The sacrifices that America had made for 70 years uh, in order to have greater prosperity and more security and more democracy were fine for the people who were the beneficiaries, but they weren't no longer fine for the United States. And that what we needed to do as a country was no longer focus on leading, but focus on winning. And winning is a very different concept than leading. Winning is zero sum. It's win-lose. It's not win-win. And if you listen to the rhetoric of the president, and if you see what he's tried to do ever since, it is about winning. And in winning, you no longer have friends or foes, or foes can become friends, and friends can become foes. 
All that matters is that you get a better deal than the other side. It's the real estate's businessman's uh, approach to international politics. And he has turned that into American foreign policy. Alliances are no longer about building common security, but about who pays how much for their defense and contributes to it. And if you don't contribute enough, then maybe we won't be there any longer. Bob Woodward's book is full of his complaint about having troops in South Korea. We are in South Korea, according to President Trump, to defend South Korea, not because we're defending the United States. NATO is about us defending Europe, not us defending the United States. Uh, and as a result, it's a bad deal. If you think you're only doing it for someone else, then by definition, it's a bad deal. Trade, same thing. Um, it is all about win-lose. It is defined in very simple terms, which is the trade deficit. And if we uh, export less than we import, then it's bad. And if we import uh, less than we export, then it's good. So we need to export more, import less, and we will have a uh, better economics. We, that's how we can win. And that's the fundamental way in which Donald Trump has executed his foreign policy. Security alliances are expensive and we should reduce them. Trade has to be balanced in favor of the United States. And oh, democracy and human rights is for other people. It's not for us. We don't have to spend any time thinking about it. And if you look at his relationship with, say, Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, which is better than it has been than his relationship with Justin, Justin Trudeau or Angela Merkel, you see the underlying idea that actually working with friends and foes is all about the same thing. It's how can you get the best deal possible. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because the basic nature of international politics has remained unchanged. And if you take American power out of the equation, you go back to the kind of system that existed before 1945. A place in which competition among states is the defining feature of international politics, in which the rules-based system that was created through American leadership no longer smothers that competition, but competition reemerges in full force. And if you read the National Security Strategy of the United States, or the National Defense Strategy uh, that Jim Mattis has put out, it is all about the return of great power competition. It's about balancing and deterring uh, powers uh, in, in that competition. And in the Trumpian world, this is a competition that the United States can win because we are the most powerful country in the world. And if we build up our military strength and we maintain our economic growth, we will have an advantage in a, global, in a world of global competition. And he's right. The United States will do quite well in a world of great power competition because we are more powerful than everybody else. The question is, will it, will it, it will do better than it does today, uh, than it has done over the past 70 years. Whether it will be better to do this alone in the competitive world or together with our allies and friends. And here is where I depart. Uh, we depart from Donald Trump, and I think many of us do. If you want to compete in this world, why not compete with people on our side? We have one thing that Russia and China don't have. We have allies. They have clients. Six of the ten largest uh, defense spenders in the world are allies of the United States. The seventh is the United States. Seven of the ten top economies in the world are allies of the United States. If you can bring allies back into the fold and believe that in this competitive world, the United States and its allies together are much more able to deal with the challenges that we have, whether they are global challenges like uh, terrorism or climate change or nuclear proliferation or indeed the challenge of a competitive world, you're better off doing it with allies than against them. Um, but that's not what Donald Trump has done. But Donald, in fact, he has made very clear that he doesn't need allies and the allies are increasingly saying maybe we have to figure out how to do this without the United States. Um, and so uh, as a final sort of thought experiment, I'm happy to go into uh, this uh, uh, in more detail, which is not in the book, uh, but it's an article that Jim and I have just published in Foreign Affairs coming out 
in the next few days is how are we going to maintain a rules-based order without American leadership? And our answer is, well, the Allies need to step up and start doing it for uh, themselves. And if you look at the large number of Allies we have, uh, take the nine largest Allies, four big European powers plus the European Union, Canada, Me uh, Canada South Korea, Australia, and Japan, uh, those powers together represent a third of global GDP, uh, they represent 20% of global military power. They represent 80% of uh, global development assistance and uh, aid of the OECD. And if those nine countries, including the European Union as an, as an, as an actor, were to work together uh, in order to maintain and uphold the rules-based order until such time that the United States decides that it needs to have a president who is also invested in this order, uh, then we are more likely to achieve uh, a, a world that we've had for the last, to maintain a world that we've had for the last 70 years where rules matter, where win-win is the uh, outcome that everyone seeks both in security and in economics, and where we are able to achieve uh, the goals that uh, wise leadership in the 1940s set out uh, by the United States for the rest of the world at that time. Um, but without others stepping up, a United States that is increasingly looking only at itself is a United States that will do quite fine for itself, but not for the rest of the world. And uh, if the, wor the rest of the world decides that it doesn't want to step up when it needs to, as I think at this moment uh, our, lead, our countries and our allies should, uh, we're all going to suffer as a consequence. But more importantly, the United States will probably suffer less than most other countries. So that's my, uh, my uh, basic thesis statement. Happy to take this discussion anywhere. I've tried to stay away from the details of Trumpian foreign policy because we're all very familiar with it, um, but give you the, the overarching uh, idea and argument. Thank you. Okay.